to my right hand side, I've got the screen. So I am going to open that now. That does mean that you get the ability to ask questions. Now, um, I will do my best to weave in the answers uh, as and when I see questions from you. If I don't get the opportunity to see your question or you don't get your question answered, don't worry because, as I'm about to prove, I will have hopefully picked up a question from last week that didn't get answered uh, and I'm going to give an answer to that very shortly. So let me just make sure uh, that we are live. Uh, it would appear we are. We have some people watching. All is good. Now, last week, almost at the end of the uh, session, at the end of the workshop, somebody asked the question, what is the difference between Adobe RGB and sRGB? And I guess the follow-up question would be, which one should I use? Well, this is one of those questions that, uh, that people will sit and debate for time immemorial, uh, because it kind of depends. In short, and without wishing to take up our entire hour of composition talking about uh, colour spaces, Adobe RGB and sRGB are about colour. They are the colour spaces that cameras can use. Now there are a variety of other colour spaces that, that you could possibly use, uh, but the two most common are Adobe and sRGB. And very simply, if you are going to be displaying an image on a screen, then sRGB is probably the one that you want to use, because the S while I don't think it stands for screen, it might, it might actually stand for screen, is the color space that most monitors will use. It's kind of, it's kind of the world's color space. It's what everybody, everybody uses. So um, if you want to know that your colors are going to look fairly consistent across screens, then sRGB uh, is a good solution for you. However, if you want more colors in your image, Adobe RGB is a larger color space uh, and Therefore, if you're going to print, particularly uh, modern inkjet printers, they can print a wider color space than sRGB, and Adobe RGB would be the best way for you to go. Good news, if you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't really matter because you're capturing the maximum color space the camera can handle, and most RAW software will allow you to switch between one or the other afterwards. So you don't necessarily have to make the choice at the point of shooting, you just need to remember to change it to suit what you're going to be doing with your images, later on. So that's that question answered from last time. Now, uh, let's have a look. There we go. Okay, no, no new questions. So we're going to start. And as I said, uh, today we are going to be talking about creative framing and composition. And straight away, the very first thing before I show you any pictures, is I want you to have a look at kind of where I've positioned myself within the frame. So actually, I'll come back to here Look at where I've positioned myself in this frame. I'm not dead center. I'm not just here. I'm over to one side and I'm kind of looking, if I turn my head like this, into the frame. I've got myself a little bit of space to look into uh, and I am not dead center in the frame. And that's something we're going to be talking about in a little while. But straight off, composition is something we are all innately aware of. Even if we don't know the rules, You'll know some of them uh, it, by, by the end of this hour. But even if we don't know the rules, we instinctively know if something looks right or not. There is a saying in engineering, uh, if something looks right, it probably is. And we all have that innate ability. We all know when something looks right. And we all know when something looks a little bit off, even if we can't put our finger on exactly what that is. OK, so let's come back here uh, and... Uh, there you go. Mad gaming scientist, I'm glad you're here and you've got your question answered. I apologize I didn't get to it last week. Okay, so here we are. So creative framing uh, and composition. Now, we're going to be talking about a variety of different things uh, and uh, I'm going to put them all up on screen here for you so that you know what we've got coming up. Uh, so we've got the rule of thirds and you'll note that the rule of thirds is, is in kind of quote marks because one of the issues I have with photography, and particularly when people are learning photography, is that they can be very constricted by rules. Uh, and the reality is that photography is an art. And that means that there aren't really any rules. You're taking pictures for you um, and, and what pleases you. There are things that are globally understood to look good. And that's kind of where these rules come from. But they're not really rules as much as guidelines. Uh, and I will talk about breaking the rules uh, towards the end so that you can uh, learn what we're going to cover, but also then go away and, and realize that as long as you know the rules, 
breaking them is absolutely not a problem at all. So we've got the rule of thirds and we've got perspective. We'll talk about elevation and filling the frame. Uh, we'll talk about using leading lines. We'll talk a bit about lens choices uh, and how that affects the way you're going to compose your images. Uh, we'll talk about reflections uh, and we will also talk about foreground interest. So there's a lot of things, a lot of um, help that you can get. Uh, and that's the goal of this, is to give you some things to remember when you're taking pictures uh, to make it a little easier for you to figure out exactly how you plan on composing your picture, what you're trying to achieve and what you want it to look like. Because composition is basically your method of getting the viewer's head and going, look like this, then here, then there, then here, and get to this thing, which is the subject, okay? And the way you compose is how you create that flow or balance in an image how you can control what the viewer sees. So first image up that I'm going to show you. Uh, and this first image is probably breaking quite a lot of rules. It seems slightly, maybe slightly uncomfortable, uh, or, or maybe you think it, it looks good. Now this is a musk oxen. Uh, it is taken in the cold depths of Norway in winter. The temperature was about minus 15 or minus 20. Uh, the subject is small in the frame, so I'm not filling the frame. Um, it's not sitting on an intersecting third. Uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, it is looking into the frame, so, so we've got one thing right. Um, but the image still works, and this is the point that I'm trying to get across to you, that you can break some of the rules and still get an image that looks good, that's pleasing to the eye, okay? So let's start. Uh, we're going to talk about the rule of thirds to begin with. Uh, and what is the rule of thirds? Now, the rule of thirds is a grid, okay? And it is the most well known of the visual tropes or the visual mnemonics because it's very easy for us to do. It's very easy for us to visually break up a scene. And what the rule of thirds says is that you break your scene up uh, into, uh, into nine rectangles, so three vertically, three horizontally. Uh, and then you get some intersecting points. The places where those points intersect are what you might call sweet spots or hot spots or cardinal points because they, those positions within the frame have more weight, more dominance, maybe even more balance. Our eyes are naturally drawn to them, okay? But this is not the only grid system out there. There are lots of other ones and it's why I say that the rule of thirds is only a, a basic start point. So, for example, there's also the phi grid. Now, the phi grid uh, is a more complex version of the rule of thirds. Uh, and within the phi grid, what you see is that there are four rectangles that correspond to what we call the golden ratio. Okay. Now, this is a historical, uh, mathematical, cultural, natural number that we find all over the place uh, in, in the world. Uh, and it's something that we find a natural balance in. So the phi grid is a slightly different grid uh, system. As I say, the rule of thirds is a simplification, if you will, of the phi grid perhaps, or, or of the golden mean or the golden ratio. Uh, and which one you use is up to you. It could be both, it could be neither. It could be one, it could be the other, it could depend on the picture. But you have to make that decision based on what looks good for you. And actually, um, while uh, the rule of thirds is an approximation, the phi grid is much closer to this golden ratio with those four golden ratio rectangles. But again, it's a bit of a simplification. Now, much, many software, many cameras uh, will give you the rule of thirds. Very few will give you the phi grid. So it may be that you are driven down the rule of thirds route. But what you need to know is that because it's an approximation, you don't need to follow it absolutely perfectly, okay? You can break that rule. So, what is, uh, what is the rule of thirds? Da, 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 da. Here is a, there's a question that's come in. Do these grid systems apply only to this kind of aspect ratio? Would it apply to a one-to-one -one frame as well? So if you're shooting square, um, you can still try the rule of thirds, in which case you're going to break your frame up into nine equal squares, and it will still work as an approximation. Um, they are predominantly built around uh, this kind of aspect ratio, but they will work for 
uh, for other shapes. Obviously the phi grid, uh, if you put that into a square, then you lose your golden ratio rectangles, uh, and so the phi grid would, would not be um, quite as appropriate. Um, but the rule of thirds with equal size rectangles, um, you'll just end up with equal size squares, and that can work too. Okay, So just remembering that you're breaking up into thirds horizontally and vertically is still a good start point for you if you are, I don't know, are you a medium format shooter, perhaps shooting on medium format film, uh, a 6x6 six six perhaps, um, you can still use this and it will still work uh, to a degree. So, I mentioned the golden ratio. And what is the golden ratio? Well, as I said, this is a, uh, a natural uh, phenomenon. It's a natural number. It's part of the Fibonacci series. It's something we find in nature. So, if I was to show you a picture of a nautilus shell, and in fact, I'm going to see if I can't find you a picture of a nautilus shell right now, uh, because it's very instructive, we will find this ratio uh, in nature. Let me see if I can find you an image. Um, this one will do. Uh, right, so here is a, um, uh, a, a nautilus shell. Now these, uh, these nautilus shells are, where are we, here we go. If you look at the chambers, you look at the chambers of this nautilus shell. Now I've just quickly grabbed this off the internet, so thank you to Fine Art America for uh, making that picture available quickly. Um, the, uh, the ratio between the size of each of these chambers, this is a sea creature, by the way, um, a bit like a, a squid, perhaps. Um, the ratio between the size of each of those chambers follows this golden ratio of 1 to 1.618. Uh, uh, and it is a ratio that we find particularly visually appealing. Okay? Uh, and it leads us on to, um, here let me come back here, it leads us on to uh, the golden mean uh, and the golden spiral uh, and all sorts of golden things all based around this ratio. In fact, if you were to take this golden ratio and draw it out into a spiral, that being this nautilus shell, that is the golden spiral. And you could take this shape and overlay it on your image, on your grid, and you would find it would give you a lovely flow of rectangles moving through down to a central point, which if you placed your subject there, it would have nice visual weight or, or balance to it. And there would feel like there was a natural flow through the image because we're all innately aware of it, okay? So here is that golden spiral uh, and you can see how that mimics that nautilus shell uh, that I just showed you. Now, as I say, we find this ratio in all sorts of places in nature. Um, it is obviously something that we're very tuned into. It's obviously something that is, nature is very tuned into as well. Uh, and so it pays to be aware of it uh, and to know how to apply it to your image. So if we, if we take two images, I'm going to show you two images here. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to take myself off screen so that you can see, uh, see the right-hand image clearly as well. So we've got two images, two very different pictures. Uh, one is a landscape. Uh, one is a picture of a cheetah poking its tongue out. Uh, and yet both of them conform to the approximation that is uh, the, the rule of thirds. So I'm going to take the left-hand image uh, and I'm going to overlay a grid on it. And this is a third grid. And what you'll see is that the horizon is not quite on the grid. Uh, the bush in the bottom right-hand corner sits kind of on that lower intersecting third point. And uh, the image feels like it has balance. There's space uh, in the mid-ground as well, uh, so uh, all, all works. It feels like a comfortable, balanced image. Uh, now, if I was to put these intersecting points on it, as I say, you can see the, the bush in the lower right-hand corner, uh, and we can see the island in the top left-hand corner. Um, these themselves, although the island is bigger but smaller in the picture, um, these themselves provide balance because they feel balanced within the image based on their positioning, based on them both sitting on those intersecting thirds. Again, as I say, the horizon is not quite on that intersecting third. And the key point to remember about this is that generally, we want to avoid putting our horizon smack across the middle of the frame. And later on, I'll show you why and how you can break that, okay? So we're avoiding putting our horizon on the, in the middle of the frame. And what we're doing is we're going to use 
any of those horizontal or vertical lines for our horizon line. So if we are shooting a landscape like this image on the left, I could have put the horizon line somewhere near that lower horizontal third. Had I done that, I'd have obviously had a lot less foreground and a lot more sky, so I'd have been giving more weight to the sky above. But in this case, the foreground was far more interesting. The bush, the rock face catching that sun falling onto it was far more interesting uh, and far more worthy of attention. It's what I wanted you to look at as a viewer. So I chose to position my horizon up on that upper third line or close to that upper third line. Um, and, and that's what gives the balance in this scene. Now, obviously, if I flip this over to be uh, a landscape shape shot, the same thing happens. You can position your horizon either on the upper third or the lower third, whatever suits for whatever you want to highlight in the scene. But just remembering, rarely do you put your horizon right across the middle. Okay, if we now look at the, uh, we now look at the uh, cheetah on the right-hand side, once again, we overlay the grid. Uh, we get our intersecting points and we'll, we can see that that eye, that eye that's closest to the camera, uh, which is the one we're naturally drawn to anyway, because in anything where there's an eye, uh, we are by our nature drawn to look at the eye first. That is sitting close to the upper intersecting third of that image. So we've got the vertical grid. Um, imagine the circles from the left hand side. Oh, sorry, skipped on too far. Come back. Um, imagine the circles from the, the left hand image. That eye is sitting on that upper intersecting third point. And that's why we again feel like there's balance. We've also got uh, the the leg of the cheetah coming down and out of the, the frame. Um, the nose is actually fairly close to the middle of the frame, but again, uh, we still have that balance. Okay, so remember this grid. Remember that you don't have to stick to it rigidly. I'll come back on screen now. You can take this and break it because it is not sacrosanct. It is, uh, it is an approximation of that phi grid or the gold mean that we talked about before. And what you'll find, particularly when you look at landscapes, for example, uh, as I say, the horizon shouldn't be uh, bang on that, uh, that third line. The image will feel actually slightly unbalanced. And also, if everybody always placed their horizon lines right on the third line, all the images would start looking very much the same. Going slightly above or slightly below that line is what's going to actually provide balance within the scene. Okay, we'll take a completely different image. This is, uh, this is uh, MotoGP, this is a motorbike. But again, the image is conforming to, uh, to the rule of thirds. So the, the, the motorbike is down in that lower right-hand corner. Uh, it's got space to ride into to the left. Uh, if you look at kind of the balance between what is the lower third, the mid third, and the upper third, they're roughly sitting close to those third lines. So, for example, the, the crowd, all the blurry crowd uh, above the advertising hoarding pretty much forms the upper third. Um, then you've got the track forming much of the lower, th the middle third. Uh, and then you've got the runoff area in the foreground forming most of the lower third. It's close. It's not quite on the, it's not quite there, but the image is still balanced. And that is because this thirds, as I keep saying, is just an approximation uh, and not something to be followed rigidly. It gives us a um, it gives us a simple start point uh, to break up our frame to get images into the right place or get subjects or elements within our scene into the right place. Uh, I've just seen another question: uh, Are there any other systems other than the rule of thirds and the phi grid? Well. You can break a scene up however you want. The most common that you'll find are going to be the rule of thirds and the phi grid because they form the basis or they form the approximations of this golden mean. Um, so while people have proposed other systems, this system based off the golden mean tends to be the most long-standing. In fact, if you look at um, any of the old masters, even the, the Dutch masters paintings, uh, and the old Italian painters and the French painters, and look at how they composed their images when they were painting, they were still following this golden ratio or the golden mean, uh, and hence they were therefore following the phi grid or the approximation, that being the rule of thirds grid. So people do use other systems, 
but these are the most enduring uh, and probably the easiest to use um, long term, uh, the easiest for you to get your head around. Will they work for every picture that you want to take? No, but they give you a starting point. Okay. Right, next up, another image. And this one I'm not going to overlay the grid on, but I'm trying to make the point. I'm trying to give you the examples so that you can see how this, uh, how this works. Um, so this, we've got, um, it's obviously an aerial shot. It's taken in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Uh, we've got a balloon. The balloon is not quite on that third. Um, the, um, uh, oh, another question's just come in. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we've got the base of the river um, is forming kind of the bottom of the lower third. We've got a bit of framing going on with the long shadows in the foreground. Uh, the middle section, the middle third, is formed by that, uh, that, that dense forest along the top of the river. So there's still a balance in thirds, even if the balloon is not quite on that third intersecting point. Okay, So use the, the rule of thirds as a guideline. And the great thing is, I've said it before and I will undoubtedly say it again, Photography is subjective, and today we are dealing very much with the more subjective side of it, okay? Even when we're talking about exposure and the amount of light in a scene, that's subjective in terms of what, uh, what you want it to look like. But it's very sciencey in terms of recording light, using shutter speeds, apertures, and ISOs. Because photography is subjective, some people watching may absolutely love this picture or any of the pictures I show you. Others of you may absolutely detest it. You may think it feels uncomfortable, awkward, unbalanced, whatever it might be. But that's the lovely subjective nature of anything artistic. Uh, and photography being part science and part art is equally, uh, equally um, uh, subjected to that. I didn't want to use subjected for subjective, but uh, I'm going to have to. Uh, it is equally, uh, e equally, it applies equally to photography. So... Don't think that there's ever a right or wrong. Uh, there are, there are uh, things that people like and things that people don't like. Okay? If we all liked the same things, um, the world would be a really, really boring place. So, uh, so, so don't feel you have to like everything. Okay? Uh, now, uh, question. Da, 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 da. Uh, right. So is there a sequence for these intersecting points as in which one we would look at first. Not necessarily. You'll, the, the eye will be drawn to whichever one you place a dominant subject on. So you'd probably want to avoid putting a subject on each of those intersecting points because that would confuse the viewer. We, we, we're, uh, in our nature, not, uh, not that great at looking at things. So if we had... Uh, several things to look at, we get overwhelmed with visual information and we don't know where we're supposed to be looking. So in terms of what order you might look at them in, uh, that's, it's not like we're going to go around in a spiral like this. What I can say is that generally people read images from left to right. So we, we will naturally look at the left hand side of an image and flow across to the right hand side, but that's not always the case. Uh, and that equally doesn't mean that you should always compose your images with that in mind, because obviously sometimes uh, sometimes it's not going to uh, it's not going to work. Otherwise, all your images will always again look the same. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, uh, Chinmay says, "I have a question. How does a phi grid work?" Uh, so I don't have a phi grid that I can overlay on an image. But if I skip back, uh, let me. Uh, uh, let me just jump back to, um, let me come here so that you can see this. Right, I'm going to put this back up again uh, and we'll quickly talk uh, once more through the phi grid. So um, if you can imagine this grid uh, and place an image underneath it, because those, those rectangles, so they are the ones that are uh, in the corners. So top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. They're the ones that correspond to our golden mean or golden ratio. Uh, and all it means in, in, in the sense of how it works is that your intersecting points relative to the rule of thirds are just in a slightly different place. Uh, and also your horizon line will be in a slightly different place. So actually seeing the phi grid next to the rule of thirds 
you can see that your horizon line for your, your horizontal horizons tend to be, oh, come back, sorry, pushing accidental buttons, there we go, uh, tend to be uh, slightly closer together in the middle. Uh, and that bottom section is not a third, it's slightly greater than a third, and the middle bar is slightly less than a third, and then the upper bar uh, is slightly more than a third again, okay? So how it works is just you have to visualize this uh, and overlay it on your scene. And effectively, while I said I don't have a grid to overlay, uh, if I come back here uh, and show you, uh, show you these images again, uh, then you'll note that when I position the grid on this uh, image, because of where that horizon is, it's much closer to, to the phi grid uh, than it is to the rule of thirds because that horizon line is slightly shifted. Okay, uh, right, let's get back to where we were uh, without jumping through multiple, uh, multiple pictures. Okay, so having uh, shown you this, here is the, the grid, um, here is the grid overlaid on this uh, on this scene of uh, the Masamara with the balloon uh, and you can see where the balance comes in the foreground third or the lower third the middle third and the upper third uh, there we go and also you can see that that balloon is actually slightly higher than the intersecting point although it's pretty close to the intersecting point uh, from left to right or uh, in, a, in a vertical arrangement okay now this doesn't just work for landscapes and pictures of cheetahs, but it works for pictures of people as well. Uh, and the big mistake that many people make when they start taking pictures of people is that they put the subject right in the middle of the frame. Again, that can work. And I have absolutely taken pictures where I've placed a subject's face right in the middle of the frame, uh, and they are successful pictures. But again, generally, we don't. So here, um, this, this little boy in, uh, he's also in Kenya actually, in a charity school in Kenya. I've positioned him off to one side. So if you can visualize that grid over him again, that rule of thirds grid or the phi grid, you'll see that his eye line uh, is pretty much on that upper third line. Uh, and the vertical third runs right down the middle of his nose pretty much or, or just slightly off to one side of it. And we've got what we would call a lot of negative space off to the other side. Now designers are very tuned into negative space. There is no harm in having a lot of empty space in a scene. It actually gives a subject space to breathe. Uh, you'll also notice he's looking marginally into the frame. It's, there's a lot of very strong eye contact uh, and that's something that's very key with pictures of people is that eye contact can be very helpful because we're drawn to the eyes. Uh, but he's got that space because he's looking marginally to his right or to the left as we look at the picture, so our eye would naturally follow where he's going. So if we read an image left to right, we start in the open space, there's nothing there, our eye quickly gets to the eyes. We stay in the eyes, we feel that it's comfortable in the frame, it's balanced, we cycle round because we kind of look where he's looking, we're held by his eyes, we go back to the space but there's nothing on the left so we come back uh, and essentially, as I said before, when you're taking a picture you're controlling how a viewer sees it and you're trying to control where their eyes go, what they look at, okay? Uh, there we go, right, any more questions? No, that was a thank you. Uh, Chinmay, you are most welcome. Hopefully I answered it sufficiently for you. Uh, okay, there's another, another portrait. Again, same thing, the subject's not in the middle of the frame, uh, her eye line is close to that third, her nose line is on that third, or at least close to. We feel like there's balance, we've got the strong eye contact once more, the image works, it feels comfortable to look at. It's not visually jarring. Now, visually jarring is something that we can use. If you're photographing something um, that is an uncomfortable subject, why not go with visually jarring? Absolutely give it a go. Uh, there is no harm in doing that. But generally what we're looking for is balance and flow uh, and something that makes a viewer want to look for a longer period of time. Okay. Filling the frame, so that's that's it for the rule of thirds because I don't want to labour the point uh, and, and the phi grid. As I say, the rule of thirds is that approximation, um, but it gives you a very simple visual cue in how to break up your scene uh, and, and where you may start positioning things. Okay, now filling the frame. Um, when we are taking pictures of subjects, uh, one thing we can do, instead of giving them space, I showed you two images with a bit of space in them, uh, 
we can look at filling the frame with our subject. And if we fill the frame, we give the viewer no choice but where they have to look. So this little lion cub uh, in, in Kenya, that's three Kenya pictures in a row, look at that, um, is, is very large in the frame. We know exactly where we're supposed to be looking at this picture. You as a viewer have no, um, uh, no confusion about what you're supposed to be looking at. I've, I've effectively positioned that subject that says, right, here is a lion cub, you'll look at that. We've got really strong eye contact, uh, so we're naturally drawn to the eyes. When you look at the picture a little bit longer, though, you will discover there are other things going on because there's a bit more in this frame. This is not absolutely jam-packed full. There's a little bit of space around it because we've also got the mother, okay? Uh, so there is the lion cub mother just off to one side uh, and you're not drawn to that first off. She's, she's there, but she's not where your eye is drawn to your eye goes straight to that cub. Uh, and it's, it's why I use this image to, to explain that. Because the lion cub is so big in the frame, many people would not even notice the mother next to it. They would pay no attention to what's going on next to that cub because they're so stuck on this big thing in the frame being the lion cub. So filling the frame is a great way of controlling exactly where the viewer looks and, and what they're gonna look at. You give them no choice but to look at that part of the subject. Um, same again here now I showed you a picture of the baby musk ox right at the start in Norway these are two adult musk ox and they do this they, they butt heads uh, if you want to know what they are they're basically sheep uh, they're very old prehistoric sheep uh, with short tempers poor eyesight and ability to run at about 40 kilometers an hour uh, they're also quite large they weigh about 400 kilograms so if they run at you you tend to get out of the way. You try to avoid scaring them or indeed getting in the middle of this because they love to butt heads. Um, again, this is, a, now this is a slightly more abstract picture but it's still filling the frame. You're in no two minds. There's no confusion about what you're supposed to be looking at here. You need to look at the, the subject and the reason I photographed this image like this is because with all of that wind-blown snow, it could be quite a hard image to see. You wouldn't know quite where to look. There's, there's some distracting elements to it. So by filling the frame, I'm forcing you to look straight in at those horns, uh, at the heads butting. And as you get there, you'll then see the eye in the musk ox to the right hand side. So eyes are super powerful, as I said. But in this case, you're probably not going to see it first off. You'll see the lighter area because our eyes are also naturally drawn to light parts in a scene. So here, if in, in cutting out as much of the surrounding white, I'm forcing you to look in at the bits that I want you to see, that being the head butting. Okay, uh, next up, um, more filling of the frame. So here, this is obviously incredibly filling of the frame uh, for a portrait. Uh, we have got, uh, we've got a part of a subject, a part of a face, not even a whole face. But I've filled the frame with the face and because we've got super strong eye contact, again, you're in no two minds about where you're supposed to be looking. You are drawn naturally to that eye. Uh, and then the colours just provide a nice supporting palette to that really powerful eye contact. And from the same shoot, uh, again, really close in, you're, you're drawn straight to the lips of this subject. You know where you're supposed to be looking. Uh, there's nothing else to look at other than some lovely colours in the background. Um, but you're drawn right to the key part of this scene, the thing that I really want you to see. And actually, what we could say is if you were to overlay that grid, uh, the, either the, the phi grid or the rule of thirds grid, you would see that the, uh, the lips are kind of on that third coming in from the side. And then we've got the open space over on the right-hand side. So actually, if you could visualise this next to either of the two portraits that I showed you a couple of pictures ago, you'd see that they're using a very similar compositional tool, very sim similar compositional arrangement, just only looking at a section of a face rather than looking at a whole face, okay? So this visual arrangement works whether you're in really close and you have a small subject or you're filling the frame, uh, or whether you're a bit wider out and you've got space or environment or subject around your subject uh, that you, you want to use. So, um, 
so, so remember that because that's a that's a very key point. I've just noticed some other questions come in. Um, uh, I'm going to say minor. It may be M Y N A. You, it, uh, maybe that's an acronym, but you because you, you put it all in capitals. But I'm going to say minor. Uh, your question is. Do you ever crop your photos to align the subjects to the grid or do you make sure the framing is right while shooting? So I'm pretty lazy when it comes to, to time on the computer. I like to get my images right when I'm shooting. So I haven't yet shown you an image that I've cropped. All of them are as they were when they came out of the camera in terms of their composition. I very much like to get an image right in camera. Um, I'm, uh, I think I'm weird like that. Um, I, I very much think of myself as a photographer who uses camera techniques to get it right. That doesn't mean that it, it, it's right or wrong, it's just what works for me. So I've not shown you anything cropped. I know some people do, um, but actually cropping can't always fix bad composition. If you fundamentally don't have the right balance, uh, this will come in when we talk particularly about elevation later on in, in, in this talk. Um, if you fundamentally don't have the right balance or the right arrangement of subjects within the frame relative to each other, no amount of cropping is going to fix that. So my best advice is to try and get it as right as you can or as close as you can. If you need to tweak later, maybe you don't have a long enough lens um, and you therefore need to crop in later, think about how you're going to crop at the point of shooting so that you get the balance right between where things fall in the frame. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's answered your question. Lena, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I hope, I don't know whether you mean the, the whole presentation or these pictures, uh, but thank you so much. Um, right, moving on. Lens choice. So when it comes to choosing a lens, um, obviously depending on your camera system, you can have an incredibly broad choice of lenses from incredibly wide, um, like super, super wide. Uh, this is not super wide, but like this, where you get to see everything that's going on behind me, uh, or you can get telephoto uh, like this. Um, there's super telephoto, there are macro lenses, um, all, all can be used for different things. And there's no one right lens choice for what you're shooting. It's just about how you want to compose your image and the story that you want to tell with your picture. So uh, let, me, let me give you an example. So here is a landscape. I photograph a lot of landscape pictures. Um, this is the Lake District uh, in the north of England. Um, it's a beautiful part of the world. In fact, I've, I've literally just got back from there. Uh, I came back from there late last night. Um, where I was doing some more, uh, some more testing, some more photography and, and testing a new camera. So here is a wide angle view. Now, when we think landscape, we normally think wide angle view. We normally think of, of this big vista, sprawling vista, seeing lots, seeing the whole environment of what's going on. Side note, look at the composition, look at how this sits. Uh, relative to the rule of thirds. In fact, going forwards, any picture you ever look at from now on, I would like you to visually try and work out how it was taken in terms of its composition. Does it feel balanced? Does it have flow? If so, what compositional guidelines, rules, memory jogs has the artist used to create that balance? How does subjects balance within the frame? Where's the horizon if it's a landscape? Is it upper third, lower third? Where are things that you're drawn to look at, positioned, are they right in the middle, are they on the thirds? Keep doing that and you will develop your eye and it will become innate. When you're looking through the viewfinder or when you're looking at a scene, you will innately know how you're going to compose it. Okay, You're developing that visual muscle uh, and you can only do that by continually working it out, looking at pictures and analysing how they're composed. So, Back to this, this is, uh, this is obviously the wide angle view. So this is shot with a, a 24 mil lens uh, and we have got the wide view of this valley. It's called, uh, this is called the Buttermere Valley. Uh, so the two, the two lakes that you can see, the first one is Buttermere and the one in the distance in the background, uh, that one is Crummock Water. Uh, and it kind of approximates the thirds or the phi grid. Um, but really the point I'm trying to get across here is that if this is the wide angle view, this is not the only picture that you could take. So the next picture was taken from exactly the same location. 
I didn't move my tripod, I simply changed the lens I was using. So this is 24 mil, and where I want you to look is right in the middle of this picture. So at the bottom end of that first lake, uh, the, the one that I said was called Windermere, as you get to the bottom shoreline before the fields in the middle of the frame start, that's where we're going to be looking next. So here is the long lens version of that picture. Now this is, um, this is a 100 to 400 mil lens with a two times extender. So this is an 800 mil lens used for a landscape. Now it's, it's still a landscape picture, but it's a section of a landscape. And in this picture, instead of showing you the whole scene, I'm showing you the lake edge and the fields and the beautiful light on the fields and the farmers that were mowing the crops, okay? So still a landscape, but a totally different lens. Uh, and this is where the whole lens choice discussion comes in. Do you want to show the entire wide scene or do you want to put on a long lens uh, and, and look for sections of it? Now, we're going to go back to the... Um, uh, back to the previous shot because the next section I want you to see is if you can uh, look at that foreground lake, bottom here, uh, just in from the front edge, you go through, there's like a little bay on the right hand side uh, and there's a tree sitting there. So now we've seen the 24 mil, we've seen the 800 mil uh, and here, if I jump through it quickly, is the 400 mil looking at that tree looking at the mirror calm water that there was that's reflecting the beautiful blue of the sky. And we're now looking at a different section of the same scene, all without moving the camera position. So your lens choice um, affects the shot, obviously, that you're going to take, and you need to choose the lens as appropriate to what you want to achieve. Again, uh, look at the composition. Uh, where, where is the balance? There's a lot of empty space in the bottom of this scene but I want you to get to that tree. Uh, and that tree is kind of on the right-hand third. So we've got space to the left, we're drawn to that tree. We could argue that it's maybe a little bit low in the frame. Some people have said to me, I feel that tree is a little bit low. Uh, and actually I'd like a bit more space below because maybe it would feel a bit more balanced, but that's where that subjective thing of photography comes in. Uh, and if I'd gone lower, I'd have ended up cutting off too much of the trees at the top and it would have lost that lovely shape. So it's all a bit of a compromise, okay? Uh, Mina, you said, feels like both types of grids apply to the lake photo. Uh, do you mean, you mean this photo? Um, I guess they probably could. I'm just looking at it now and visualizing a phi grid. I'd actually say this is probably closer to the phi grid than the rule of thirds, um, because that mid ground, the mid section, if you take from the foreground shore of the lake through to the uh, the, the far lake shore of that front lake. A little bit beyond that, that feels like it's very much the middle section, which is that thinner section uh, that you would get in, uh, in the phi grid. So yeah, possibly, um, quite possibly. Uh, okay, uh, next up, leading lines. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a quick sip of water um, because I've been talking a while. And now we're going to look at, uh, at leading lines. Uh, we'll look at um, other things we can use to control how a viewer sees our pictures. So leading lines, here's a classic example of a leading line picture. Um, we've got a lot of foreground, but we've got a very strong diagonal line. Uh, it's almost like an arrow pointing straight into that, uh, to that statue uh, in, in, the, uh, in the background in the distance. Uh, and what I've used here is, uh, is, is the lines that were already existing uh, on the pavement, on the, on the square, uh, to give that very strong visual pointer as to where you're supposed to be looking. Because what I want you to see is that square and the statue and the beautiful architecture, uh, and those lines just literally fire you straight at it, okay? So when you find lines, and we can find lines all over the place in, in, in the world, um, I'll show you some more in a moment. When you find lines, think about how you can use them to control how the viewer gets to your subject, okay? Another example, so this is, uh, this is in Death Valley uh, in uh, California, in America, and here the lines are on the dunes. Now, 
in, 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 um, in the UAE, you've got a lot of sand dunes. So you could find leading lines. If you go out into the dunes, into the desert, um, you can find leading lines that you can use uh, to create uh, the visual guide to your picture, to how people are supposed to see your picture. So here I've aligned myself um, along those lines. So you've got the lines, the ripples in the sand that are driving you through to the background. It helps, obviously, the time of day I was shooting means that I've got low side light. Uh, so you get the light and shadow and the light and shadow over the ripples. Uh, and that helps strengthen the lines. If you look at the left hand side of this dune where it falls off because that's sitting in effectively full sun because it's facing up to the sun on the left uh, that uh, that doesn't have any of the lines in it and I've also used the curve of that dune to come in from the bottom left hand corner uh, bring you round into a, actually quite a nice s shape uh, as that dune comes in from the left bends round and then curves back out to the right hand side you've got the, the line of that dune you've got the line of the ripples in the sand all bringing you through uh, to, to the background. You've also got, conveniently enough, uh, some lines over the top in the clouds mimicking uh, the, the lines of the sand dune. So wherever you look, you've got some lines that are drawing you into the picture, keeping your attention for longer. And fundamentally, the goal of, of composition is that you make a viewer look at your picture for longer. That's what you're trying to do. What, what we don't want um, as photographers, as image makers, is for a viewer to look and then just look straight away because there's nothing else for them to see. You want to make a viewer look for longer uh, and that's exactly what composition is doing for you. You're giving the eye places to go in the picture, subjects to rest upon, balance to feel comfortable looking at, lines to suck into the picture um, to make someone look for longer. Okay, uh, next up, perspective. Okay. Now, perspective is um, uh, per perspective is um, key, and we can choose our perspective. Now, people using tripods, I see it all the time. They, when they're doing a landscape, for example, they just get a tripod out, they extend the legs, uh, and they set it to their viewing height, wherever their head happens to be, um, or as high as the tripod goes. And that's very much not the right way to use a tripod. And perspective is all about changing how you view uh, a, a picture. Now, this, uh, this is a triathlete, uh, and it was taken from a very low angle. It gives a very dynamic feel. The fact that he's actually not moving, you don't know. He, look, he could be streaming along, and I'm looking up to the sky in the background, uh, and you'd never know because I've taken it from that low angle. And I've shown you effectively a, a, a common subject, in an uncommon way. And that means that you are drawn to look at it a little bit more. If you show people the world how they see it or from their viewpoint, there's less visual interest. There's less for them to get excited about. If you show them something from an angle they don't normally see, um, then, then they're more, there's more intrigue. They're more interested in what's going on. So think about getting low like this uh, and looking up at a subject. Um, same again here, getting very low. You, you rarely see a skateboarder from below. Uh, it's a very uncommon perspective. Uh, so it, it, it takes you aback a little bit. You're like, oh, that's unusual. I don't, didn't expect to see a shot like that. Uh, and therefore the image carries more intrigue or interest. Um, if you're doing animals, if you're photographing animals and, and children, uh, then your perspective may be that you're going to try and get to their eye level because it creates a more intimate picture. When we are at an eye level with a subject, we feel more connected to it. Um, we feel like we are part of its world. When we stand and take a picture looking down on an animal or a child, it feels very much us and them. There's a separation there that's less appealing. But when, you, when you're at their eye level, it really helps draw the viewer in. They feel like they can be there, in this case, with this lion cub sitting on a mound. Also, uh, if you photograph, if I'd photographed from a higher angle, I'd have had a very distracting background of grass, but by getting lower, by changing my perspective down, I'm looking through to a more distant background that gives that lovely out of focus wash and helps concentrate the attention onto, uh, onto the lion cub. Uh, okay. Um, 
still looking at perspective again. This image on the left, uh, I'll show you both of them, the image on the left is from a slightly higher perspective. So having said it's good to get to eye level, if I was at, at eye level with these three lionesses, I would never have had that line. I'd have only seen the front lioness. So think about that and think about the image you're trying to convey, the story you're trying to convey. And while getting down most of the time to, to the level, for example, getting down to the level of this whale on the right hand side uh, creates a strong image. It makes the whale look bigger. Um, we feel like we're in its environment. The picture on the left by being slightly higher created depth, showed you there were three lionesses that they were all nicely lined up. And again, provides a more interesting picture. Okay, so it's not always get to their eye level. As I said right at the start, none of these rules are hard and fast. They're things for you to think about based on what you're trying to say with your picture. Um, we can also get very high. So these two pictures are both taken out of hotel windows. Um, in fact, they're taken out of the same hotel window. And by being very high, we create a very different perspective on the world. Um, so looking down on the, the image on the left, you get the lovely shadows from the low light. Uh, you've got the diagonal lines uh, of the crossing in the road. Uh, and the same goes for the picture on the right hand side. We've got a nice bit of open space on the right. Uh, we've got a lovely leading line. There's the cyclist uh, and, the, uh, and the pedestrian. Uh, and we've got the shadows to look upon. So don't think that it's all about getting to eye level or getting below or getting a bit above. You can also get very much higher and look down on things and again create a totally different view on the world. Most people don't get to see a, a, a sidewalk a crossing from above, okay? So creating that picture for someone to look at gives more visual interest. It gives a different way of looking at something uh, and that intrigue or interest I was talking about. Uh, okay, um, again, oh, no, sorry, let's get back, come back here, no. Oh, gone too far, apologies. Uh, uh, that was an errant click on my part. So here we go, uh, one more. You don't normally see a yacht from the top of the mast, okay? So by showing you a picture of a yacht from the top of the mast, I'm giving you an entirely different view of the boat. Um, it, it might make you feel a little bit like you've got vertigo because you're up high looking down on something, uh, but it's a very different view. It's an uncommon view uh, and it therefore carries, um, it, well, it makes you want to look at it for longer uh, to see what's going on. Now perspective uh, and elevation kind of are kind of tied, okay? Um, and there is another part of perspective before I move into elevation truly. There's another part of perspective and it can be used, the word can be used for a different feeling, which is talking about the lens choice. If we choose a very wide angle lens and get close to our subject, the background is going to be much wider and that would be a different perspective. If we shot with a 35 or a 50 mil lens, our perspective would be very much narrower, more like the human eye, which is why they're called the standard lenses. If we go for a longer lens, you imagine the field of view is narrower. So what will happen, uh, if I set this to a wide view here and you get to see everything that's going on uh, in here, you can see the light behind me. Um, all I've done is gone to a wide view and you can see a lot more of the background, okay? And I'm trying to position myself approximately in the same point of the frame. So in fact, if I was to uh, put myself here, there we go, somewhere about here, uh, that's probably close to similar framing, but because it's a wider lens, you've got a lot more of the background. If, however, I zoom in and I move backwards simultaneously, if I can do this, uh, oh, I moved across a little bit, there we go. Oh no, let's try that about there. So I've now moved back, so I've created the same framing, um, but I'm now using a longer lens. You're now seeing a lot less of the background, so again, you've changed the perspective, okay? so. That may be another way that you hear the word perspective uh, used. Okay, uh, next up we have got uh, elevation. So we've kind of, I've shown you elevation, but I want to go into uh, a little bit of elevation with a tripod, uh, particularly for landscapes, because it's so, so crucial. Uh, the height at which you take a picture from fundamentally affects the balance that you get between your 
lower third, mid third and upper third, if you want to think of it in the, in the rule of thirds. Uh, and what, what it affects, the mere matter of centimetres up and down can fundamentally make or break the balance in your picture. So if I'd photographed this picture on the left is the Great Wall of China, if I'd photographed this from a slightly higher angle, that mid area of trees would have been slightly wider and therefore my foreground would have been slightly thinner and my background or the upper third would have been slightly thinner and that would have lost the balance. If I'd come slightly lower, I would have collapsed that mid ground a little bit so the band of trees would have been thinner and I would have had either more foreground or more background. Thereby meaning I couldn't get close to the balance of the phi grid or the rule of thirds grid uh, and the image would have felt awkward or uncomfortable to look at. So when you're working with a tripod, I would like you to not get the tripod out to begin with. I would like you to go up and down with your camera, looking up and down uh, and trying to find exactly the height that you want the camera to be at then you get the tripod out to hold the camera at that height. Don't get the tripod out first and put the camera on top. Looking at to the picture on the right hand side, uh, now this picture has always uh, annoyed me, I like the picture, but there's something that, that fundamentally annoys me about it, and it's that post on the left hand side of the picture because the top of the post perfectly intersects with the shoreline in the distance. And in an ideal world, I should have shot this picture from probably this much higher up, maybe this much, maybe this much. Uh, and if I'd gone ever so slightly higher, that gap between the, between the fence post and the shoreline would have done this. And there then would have been a slightly lighter band uh, across to create separation. So this is what you might call micro composition, looking for those micro impingements. And that's where the elevation can be so crucial in avoiding those. Uh, right. Again, picture on the left, this is taken from a very low viewpoint to try and emphasize uh, the shadows uh, and that salt pan. Uh, same goes for the picture on the right hand side. Again, these pictures were taken probably two years apart. But if you want to see my visual style, I've shown you quite a lot of vertical landscapes, but you'll also notice that the horizon line in these two pictures, is that the, the upper horizon line is really very close to being exactly the same. They're marginally off. But that's how, uh, that's how I compose my pictures um, and that's how I find visual balance. Um, I'm very much a fan of a vertical landscape and I very much like that's where I feel my horizon should be. So despite this being on entirely different continents, the one on the left is in the Americas, uh, the one on the right is in Europe, uh, entirely different subjects, uh, albeit there's both mountains in there coming in from the left hand side, my composition is very similar in both images. Okay, uh, And it's a, about the elevation that I've taken the picture from. I've got very low to try and emphasize that foreground. In the left emphasizing the salt pan, uh, in the right emphasizing these, uh, these yellow, no, yellow? Pink flowers. Um, okay. Uh, next up, uh, again here, this, uh, this picture, uh, the elevation, if it was higher or lower, uh, we would end up with the mid-ground being open or closed. And I'm hoping as I show you pictures now, you're starting to see that, and you can visualise what the picture would look like if it had been a slightly higher shot or a slightly lower shot. Okay. And again, to show you it's not just landscapes, uh, here is a picture of a whale tail. Uh, if I'd been slightly lower, then the whale tail would have been over, the, over the, uh, the cliffs in the background and it would have been distracting. In this case, by being slightly higher, I create the space above the whale's tail. So it's sitting against blue. There's nothing visually distracting. I get a nice clean line all around the whale tail um, and I've got my balance in, in my approximate thirds. Notice though that the, uh, the whale is pretty much bang in the middle of the frame because if I'd framed off, uh, either way, I'd have lost some of the tail. Okay, reflections. Now, I've said that there are no rules, right? So if you've got a reflection, why don't you use it? This image is a perfect reflection top to bottom and the subject is right in the middle of the frame. Um, because 
fundamentally, I think if you have a reflection, you can make use of it. You can take the rule that says, never put your horizon in the middle of the frame and go, Ch -ch -ch -ch, tear it up and throw it away. Um, because in some situations, placing your horizon in the middle of the frame will work, okay? Uh, and reflections is one of those times uh, where you've got symmetry because we're naturally uh, drawn to things that are symmetrical. So again, two more examples. Horizon right across the middle of the frame. Uh, we've got symmetry in the pictures. Uh, and since we, we like symmetry, we visually um, enjoy seeing symmetry, um, you can take that rule of thirds and throw it away. Uh, notice, however, that there is still uh, a bit of a third going on vertically. So uh, instead of looking at the horizontals, the horizons in the middle, uh, the, the rush roofed uh, building in the right hand picture is off to the side, it's on that third, that one's not bang in the middle. Uh, the tall tower block on the right hand side of the left hand picture is kind of on that right hand third. So there's still some level of this balance being achieved in this plane in both pictures even if we're unbalanced because we've got a 50-50 uh, in, in the horizontal plane. Um, uh, <laughs> Razin, thank you for reminding me. I want to talk about cropping an image during the elevation slides. I kind of did talk about cropping a little bit, uh, but I may have skipped over it slightly. So uh, just to make sure that you understand, if you have that elevation wrong, the, the relative amount of foreground or lower third, middle third and upper third, foreground, midground and background, is not going to be fixed by taking a chunk off the top and a chunk off the bottom or bits off the side. If... Um, uh, let me uh, let me find you another picture. Um, okay, this one. Uh, if the balance between the tall building on the left and the bridge on the right-hand side was not right, if my angle was wrong, if I'd shot too far around to the right, too far around to the left, um, then no amount of cropping is going to fix that. Okay, I still wouldn't be able to achieve the balance. Um, so that was what I was wanting to get to by talking about cropping and elevation. Um, because that, you can fix a lot in post. Uh, and yes, cropping is great. It allows you to fill the frame. It allows you to get closer to a grid, but it won't necessarily fix every picture for you. Okay, you need to do it as well as you possibly can at the point of shooting. Uh, and then you've got a chance, if you do need to crop, uh, you've got a chance of still creating a, a great image. Now, this is a subjective opinion. Other people will, will disagree with it. Other people will say, no, I crop all the time. I can crop. I can make an image look great by cropping it. And, and I'm sure you absolutely can, but it won't work all the time. It's not a, um, uh, it's not a, a, a get out of jail free card. Okay, imagine you're playing Monopoly. It's not a card you can hold and says, I've done something wrong, I'm going to be able to fix it. Because you can't always get away with it. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, foreground interest. Now, um, if you've got foreground interest, you give people something to look at. If the foreground is all open, uh, people don't necessarily know where to look. Uh, but foreground interest like the rocks here, um, this will give you something for the eye to rest upon and, and in fact there's a bit of a pointer going on here uh, there's those three rocks kind of leading you through to the background um, the the foreground interest is something for the eye to see first so when you look at this picture uh, you may because there's bright snow in the background you may have gone to the mountain on the, the excuse me the mountain on the left hand side to begin with but i suspect quite a lot of you will have looked at the rock in the foreground first and then flowed your way through the picture. And what would have happened is you've seen the rock, you'd have probably followed the line of rocks, you'd have got to the, um, the base of the reflection, the edge of the lake, you'd have gone across to the big black thing on the right-hand side, the mountain on the right-hand side, the dark area, and because that's dark, it's acting like a break or a visual block, so it's stopping your eye drifting out of the frame, and then you're coming back around through the mountains in the background uh, to that mountain uh, over on the left-hand side. So foreground interest has given us something in the foreground rather than just having empty space. And it's also been used as a visual cue to show you how to look around the picture. Uh, same again, 
Uh, now, I often use rocks uh, in, in, um, in landscapes, in, in water, because they're very good for foreground interest. Um, I jokingly once said that I carry a big bag of rocks around with me, uh, and when I can't find uh, rocks, I just take a few out and throw them down in the water. Uh, it, it was a joke. I don't actually carry rocks around with me, uh, although my camera bag sometimes feels like I do. Uh, so finding these rocks, searching out foreground interest, um, gives you a, an anchor point or something to start uh, the composition of your image from. So in this situation, I'd be walking around looking for something I could use. I know I'm going to get a great reflection, but I need something in the foreground. Because if you, if you imagine those rocks being there and just having that clean reflection, um, it, it wouldn't look quite as interesting. There wouldn't be any sense of depth. Foreground interest in this situation is also providing a depth because we've got the rocks nice and close and we've got the background. So there feels like there's a separation. It feels like this is a big environment that we're looking through. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, breaking the rules. We're getting towards the end now. So you'll hear people say, don't have a subject looking out of the frame. Generally, it's a good idea. If I was continually looking out of the frame here, like this, you'd be wondering what I'm looking at over here. Okay, I had to figure out the mirror of this. So if I'm looking over here, I'm looking out of the frame, you'd be trying to go, well, what's he looking at? Why is he not looking at the camera? If I'm looking at you, that's good. You're, I'll probably hold your attention. If I look slightly into the frame here, so I turn my head ever so slightly, oh, I'm coming out of frame, if I turn my head slightly this way, then I'm looking into the frame and you feel like this open space here uh, has a purpose. It's got some something for me to look at, for you to look at. But you can break those rules. So here is a, here is a model uh, that I was photographing for the, it was a fashion shoot uh, for the handbag manufacturer and she's looking out of the frame and yet the picture works. You've got balance, you've got flow, you've got intrigue. So while the guideline or the advice is don't have a subject looking out of the frame, don't stick to it all the time, okay? Uh, I've already shown you pictures with the horizons in the middle. Uh, here's another example. In theory, I shouldn't have placed this bird down in the bottom left-hand side. I should have placed this bird um, on the right-hand side. But if I'd done that, you wouldn't have got any of that water spray. It would have, you'd have lost it. You'd have just had a big load of emptiness on the left-hand side and none of the drama that was going on. Okay, so by breaking the rules, by positioning my subject off to the left-hand edge, I've given the drama, I've given the interest and the things to look at with all of the water drops as the bird has the wash. Uh, and now here we've got really strong eye contact, but we do have a subject pretty much right in the middle of the frame. Now in this case, it's helped by that strong eye contact. If you put the subject right in the middle of the frame, I'm gonna try to work out the middle is here, and I look straight at you, then it's very much more powerful um, and you can get away with me being in the middle of the frame rather than me being slightly more comfortably off to one side, okay? So um, think about breaking the rules. Don't stick to them rigidly. It helps to know the rules, and I'm hoping that that's what this is giving you, the knowledge of some of the rules that maybe you were aware of but didn't understand fully, so that you can then go out and use them as your start point and break them creatively. Breaking rules creatively is brilliant. Breaking rules accidentally um, is not so good because you don't break them in the right way. You've still got to find that flow or that balance. And you can only do that if you know the rule to begin with and know how you can break it, okay? Uh, final example, uh, you'll notice that the horizon is actually pretty much across the middle of this frame, but the sun peeking over and the point of the cairn, the rock pile on the right hand side, are kind of balanced left to right. So this, this image breaks quite a lot of rules, but it's still quite a pleasing image to look at. You know where you're supposed to look, you've got the sun, you've got that rock cairn there, nicely balanced side to side. Although the horizon is in the middle, it still kind of works. Okay, so don't, in summation, stick to the rules 100%. Okay, uh, and finally, uh, a, a big lot of open space. So there is a huge chunk of open space off to the right-hand side of this image and a very small bluebell uh, on the left-hand side. And using that negative space creates a feeling of, uh, of emptiness, I guess, or loneliness. So by breaking the rule of filling the frame, by providing what must be 
70% of this image, maybe 80% of this image is just empty nothingness for you to see on the right hand side, just a little bit of purple colour. By giving you that, I've made this bluebell feel very small and insignificant because it's like a small little flower. It's still beautiful, but it's a small little flower uh, in, in a big sea of, of world, okay? And that's what the composition is, is doing for it. Okay, I'm going to wrap up now. I'm going to say thank you very much. I think I'm looking through the questions. I got all of the questions. Uh, I'm glad I managed to answer all of those. There are none left over that I need to answer next week for you. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session on creative framing. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, we've got something a little different coming up for you. Next week, we will not be talking um, uh, theoretical. There won't be slides. I will actually be shooting something. Uh, so we'll be doing a bit more of a practical. You could maybe follow along. I'll be giving you some advice uh, on how to photograph various different things. Uh, have a look on the, uh, the Exposure website, workshops.exposure.ae. Have a look there and you will be able to find out all of what's going on. Register for the next workshops. Uh, get the reminders so that you don't miss out. Uh, you can get your questions answered. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Uh, please, everybody, stay safe. Stay well. Keep shooting. Uh, try and put into practice some of the things that I've told you. And I really look forward to seeing you all on the next one next week. Same time, same place next week. In the meantime, bye-bye for now. Thank you very much.